Hey everyone, it's Jess. Today I wanted to do a video on how to care for the Christia vespertilinus, vespertilinus, which is this plant right here. This plant is also known as the red butterfly uh, plant or the swallowtails plant. And you can definitely see why with his amazing leaves. So I got my plant about three months ago uh, in February and he's grown, I would say he's grown about that much, which is amazing. I must admit, when I first got this plant, I really had no idea how to care for him, which was a big risk on my part because I like to do a bit of research before I actually purchase my plants. But I've got, I've had this guy for about three months or so and so far he's been doing okay. So I thought I'd just do a care video for everyone. I was actually inspired because one of my plant friends on Instagram, The Leafy Diaries, actually has one of these plants and she sent me a message one day asking me, you know, if there were any tips and so I was like, oh, um, this is what I, I do with my plant, which is sometimes not a lot. But I thought I'd actually do a little bit of research as well to supplement the knowledge I had with growing this plant for myself. So this plant is actually a plant that it's native to the tropics around the world. So that's the East Indies, uh, Brazil, uh, Jamaica, Southeast Asia region. So that region around the equator. This plant is actually a weed in Jamaica, so it can be quite prolific and I can understand why because that's, this plant is a, uh, it, it grows by sowing its seeds and so I can imagine when this plant flowers and when the temperature is just right, his seeds are going to go everywhere so it's just going to grow pretty quick. It lives on the grasslands or it lives on the forest floor. The Christia is a plant which is part of the legume family. So this is in the same family as peas and beans. Of course, this plant isn't grown uh, for its peas or beans. It actually doesn't have peas or beans, but this plant does have medicinal um, properties. I've actually read that this plant can be used to treat tubulosis tuberosis tuberosis and um, snake bites so this plant is edible but from the more medicinal sense of the word as a mature plant this plant can grow up to heights of 60 to 120 centimeters tall which is quite tall uh, for a plant you know that's this is still a quite a small specimen but when it does get big it can get quite big and I've read that the wingspan of its leaves can actually get up to one to two inches long which is probably about the size of this leaf the leaves right here as this plant matures its stem does become a lot more woodier and I've heard that this plant whilst it looks incredibly delicate can't even see the, the thickness of its stem. It's actually quite robust for a plant. I think as this plant gets taller, I'm going to support it with a stake so that when it gets windy, it doesn't blow over too much. As a house plant, this plant is kept for its ornamental foliage. And you can definitely tell by just looking at the leaves how beautiful that foliage is and how unique the foliage is. It's got these amazing stripes along the, the leaves. It reminds me, and, and my one, it started off as being quite purple, but it started to get these green leaves with the maroon stripe, which is very reminiscent of the Christia um, omniata, om, om, ornata, which is, I think, one of its cousins. But yeah, this is a plant, it's, it should have purple leaves, but it's just given me some green. Now the reason for that, and um, our first tip is around lighting, is lighting does impact the uh, color of the foliage for this plant. So uh, the more light you give it, the more purple this plant will become. Now with lighting, you just wanna keep in mind on this channel, I feel like the only lighting we ever talk about here is bright indirect light, which is true for this plant. You don't want to keep it in direct sunlight and particularly because I live in Australia, our sunlight is very, very strong. Um, you don't wanna give it the full afternoon light because that's just way too strong. So 
I keep it in a very sheltered location. It's probably more uh, shaded than I need it to be, but I, I guess personally for me, I was just a bit concerned because, you know, his leaves are so delicate. It's like tissue paper thin and so I didn't want his leaves to burn uh, which is why I keep it in the location that I do. It does get some dappled morning sun but I think as winter progresses with sunlight getting more weak and less during the day I have witnessed the color of his foliage change which is I think why he's giving off less purple leaves and more of this green foliage which I think is quite fascinating. Um, it can tolerate shade but it just might not give you that that incredible foliage. It does well living indoors so this makes it a really good houseplant if you're not getting that much sun. In terms of watering for this plant a big tip for this plant is you want to keep its soil quite evenly moist so I check up on him every one or two days just to make sure that his soil is still quite moist. I do also keep my plant outside which allows the water or sorry it allows the soil to dry out a lot more quicker which is why I keep an eye on him a little bit more uh, versus if you're keeping him indoors as a um, indoor houseplant you probably his soil is probably going to stay a lot more moist for a lot longer so you probably don't have to check up on him that much. Um, it's a very important thing to not let this plant dry out so make sure you water him at least once every couple of days. If you're keeping him outside you're probably going to water him a little bit more compared to if you're keeping him inside. In the height of summer I watered my plant every two days because I kept him outdoors but now as it gets cooler and we're getting into autumn I will water him once every week and I do check to see if his soil stays moist which it has. Speaking of soil I've read that this plant likes loamy soil and loamy was a new word I learnt from doing this research. That means a soil mix which is high in clay and sand content which helps retain that moisture. I've kept my plant in a mix of orchid bark, um, a little bit more soil and perlite. That, has actually, that is actually quite a moisture retaining medium. Um, sorry, that's actually quite a moisture retaining medium. So one thing that I wanted to just call out to everyone is when you're doing the research for taking care of your plants, you're going to come across information like loamy soil. It's important to be a little bit critical and to understand the author's perspective when they're, when they're writing or when they're putting up that information because in its natural habitat, that type of soil may actually well work quite well for this plant because it's got other ways for the water to run off and not waterlog um, the soil but as a house plant where you're keeping him in a container and the water is going to have a little bit more trouble evaporating or running off you just want to be you just want to apply a Whoa, mosquito <laughs> You just want to um, you just want to apply a critical mind in deciding the type of information to use to look after your plant, particularly if you've kept it as a house plant. So I would suggest that if you are keeping this as a house plant, I reckon a standard potting medium of orchid bark, organic potting soil, and perlite will be great for this plant. Perlite is important because you do want that medium to still be quite well draining. With watering, one of the reasons why you want to stay on top of your watering, particularly during its growing seasons in spring and summer, is because that's what's going to actually help your plant grow. And I think that was a key tip for me when I actually first got this plant. I recognized that it was growing and so I kept giving it water and so it's kept growing so I think that's a good um, tip to have in mind. So from a temperature perspective as a plant that's native to the tropical regions of the world ideal temperatures are probably between 15 to 28 degrees so if you're keeping it as a house plant those temperatures will actually work quite well. The one thing I would say is I keep my plant outdoors and so as it gets cooler now uh, the nights are getting below 10 degrees I should start bringing this plant home. This plant won't survive below temperatures of 10 degrees so that's something to keep in mind and for those of you in the northern hemisphere where it snows and there's frost be sure to bring your plant indoors because that's probably detrimental to 
to this plant. I touched a little bit on growing season. So growing season for this plant is spring and summer. Um, one of the tips there is when you see this plant um, grow, I would recommend give it more water because that's definitely going to help your plant grow a lot more. From a fertilizing perspective, I gave this guy fertilizer. Every week or so during summer, I would give it a, a diluted amount of all-purpose liquid fertilizer, which seemed to help him quite well. I didn't, I didn't hear any complaints from him, but he can't really say anything. The one thing that I would touch on is that on the internet I've come across multiple sources around whether this plant dies back or not. Uh, some sources claim this plant to be a deciduous plant which means a plant that dies back during the cooler months whereas others have characterized it as a perennial. It's going to be my first winter with this plant. I do think that if I keep him indoors and bring him indoors I don't think his leaves are going to die back but we'll have to see. I have heard from members of the plant community that their, uh, that their red butterfly has died back before, so possibly that is, a, that is something to look out for. When it dies back, my expectation, or if it dies back, my expectation is that its leaves will drop off, but its stem, its stem structure should mostly still remain intact. And the reason why I say this is because I think that this plant, as it particularly when it matures, it gets a woody stem. So it's not a herbaceous plant where the stem is that green fleshy part that would die back, so such as your alocasias. So my expectation is if this guy does die back, I would expect the leaves to drop off, but the stem structure to remain intact. So if your plant is dying back, including its stem, I would just be mindful to check for other reasons like root rot or um, any other diseases in case it's not your plant dying back. From a humidity perspective, um, as this plant is native to the tropical areas, humidity would be a beneficial factor for this plant. Uh, as you might know, I keep my plant outdoors. It's quite dry in Sydney, so I think the humidity is quite low, if if 15% at all. But I've heard up to 40% humidity is quite good for this plant, which makes sense because given that its natural habitat is in grasslands during, in those tropical regions, I wouldn't expect the humidity to be that high. From a propagation perspective, this plant grows from seeds, so this plant will get give you flowers and once those flowers are pollinated it will start to germinate seeds so you do need a pollinator to create those seeds i have heard that you can propagate this plant based on stem cuttings although i think as a as a plant with a woodier stem it can be a little bit tricky i personally haven't propagated this plant yet because he's still a little one but I'm probably not going to propagate him because I, I can't bear to cut off his delicate his delicate leaves. And the last tip I have for everyone is pests. Now I've heard that this plant can be relatively pest free. However, the one thing to keep an eye out for are aphids, specifically white flies. White flies. So they're a particular plant. I mean, sorry, <laughs> they're a particular pest that will attach itself to the stem and suck out the sap which I think was a little bit unusual to, to read that on the internet because I don't think this guy has very fleshy stems with that much sap for insects to, to suck off. Sorry, that sounded very rude. Um, to, to attach themselves and um, extract the sap. Uh, but I, I'm probably, I might be wrong. My recommendation is keep an eye out for fungus gnats if you are keeping this indoors because you are keeping that soil quite moist which is a great environment for fungus gnats and also given that this plant doesn't need that much shade so is it really noisy with the birds <laughs> sorry if that's distracting because you might be keeping it in a shadier location, that's actually a great environment for fungus nets. So I would say if you're keeping him indoors, just keep an eye out for fungus nets. And the other one is keep an eye out for root rot. The reason for that is because it's recommended to keep the soil mixture quite moist, that's a great environment for 
root rot. So just bear in mind, if you do see his ye leaves yellowing or it's dropping a lot of leaves, definitely check up on his roots. But yeah, guys, I hope you enjoyed this care video on the uh, red butterfly wing plant. It's a beautiful plant and um, I'm very pleased to, to have one. I've got to say, I think I've been pretty lucky with this guy because he hasn't given me a lot of trouble and I, I, I think he's a very beautiful plant. He does reward me with some amazing fluttering, particularly when the wind blows and his little leaves flutter like this. It does look like butterfly wings. But guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, please let me know by leaving them in the comments or just send me a DM on my Instagram. Otherwise, guys, I will see you. I will see you tomorrow. Bye.